It is an extreme honor for me today to be interviewing my idol. Um, when I got to school in 1987, Bill Blatchford was already crushing it back then. And when I got out of school, um, I listened to a lot of people and you were my instant idol. Um, I can't tell you how much I worship the ground you walked on. Uh, my assistant, Jan, we all drove down to yep. Tucson. Um, and, um, and I was so lucky because at the end of the Tucson seminar, your flight was in Phoenix, where I live, and you were saying how you needed to find a cab ride back, and I just felt, I said, well, I'll give you a ride. Yeah, you did. And me and uh, my ex-wife, Judith, uh, we thought we were the luckiest people in the world because we got to give the man, we got him two more hours. We had 90 miles back to the airport, and we just thought we were the luckiest people in the world. But uh, Bill, uh, thank you so much for all you did for me personally. Thank you so much to all you for dentistry. Another thing I'm proud of you is, I, I should have listened to you earlier, is um, you were always in, into health. Yes. And I didn't get that um, memo until I turned 50. And gosh darn it, every year on Bill's birthday, he does his age in push-ups. Now, I'm not going to tell you his age if he wants to, he can, but I'm uh, I'm 52. I can't do 52 push-ups. I mean, oh, I, I, I mean, I, I, dude, I don't know anybody that can do that many push-ups at any age. So I mean, you're crushing it in health. Um, health is the only true wealth. Mm -hmm. And you were teaching me how to um, be wealthy in dentistry, and now I'm 52, and you're still my idol in how to be healthy, so you can make more wealth in dentistry. But so, uh, so I, I want to start. Um, I want to start with. Uh, I only get you for an hour, and here's our little stopwatch thing. But uh, I want to. I, I first want to ask. Here's my first question to you: Is um, you've been in dentistry what 50 years? Oh well, close to it. Graduated in 1970. You graduated in 1970, and this is 2015, so that's, uh, that's, that's 45. Uh, 40, 45 years. Plus four years so, of dental school, 49. You just, so, you just Bill, had it. You, you're, um, when you hear kids walk out of dental school today, um, a lot of them play a violin that says, ah, Bill, you know, when you got out of school, there was only three dentists, and anyone could be successful, and this and that. Now I'm walking out of school, and I got $300,000 of student loans, and when you got out of school, they were closing down dental schools. I'm getting out of school when they're opening up dental schools. So my first question to you, Bill, is um, are the golden glory years of dentistry, are they behind us? Um, what would you... Just, uh, here's my first question. What would you tell the 5,000 graduates who are going to, this is March, who are going to be walking out in two months, 5,000 American kids are going to walk out, they're going to say, congratulations, you're a doctor, here's the bill for $350,000. What would you tell that kid? Well, first off, thanks for inviting me. And uh, 20 years ago, I was that old guy at 52 that you're <laughs> now. So, anyway, I, I look forward to this opportunity. But I, I think that's a great question, and, and there are two ways to look at the world. About 95% of the people look at the world from a place of scarcity. In other words, what you're answer, the answer to your question these students have, if you're coming from scarcity, you would say, well, my gosh, when you got out of dental school, we were graduating 3,500 dentists a year, now we're graduating five, almost 6,000, and it's not, you know, the opportunity is not there. But you want to remember something. The other way to look at things is from abundance. I mean, think about this for a moment. Think about opportunities in the world. I mean, you, you built Dentaltown when the internet came along, uh, and people were saying, oh my gosh, the print media is dying, print media is dying, newspapers are closing, newspapers are going broke, the newspaper gets thinner and thinner every morning. But where do we go for our media today? And look at the billionaires that have been created in this new environment of, of the internet, and as you're talking to me this morning, the iPhone. Now think about this, back about, 300 years ago, oil in the desert was just something that got camel's feet dirty. Think about it. That's all the value. It had no value. Oil had no value. 1900 comes along, the Industrial Revolution, and the big billionaires were made in the oil business. Well, now we're kind of moving on beyond that. But I think in dentistry, here's the thing. It is true there are a lot of dentists graduating. It is true they have a lot of debt, way more debt than we had. Um, I graduated from dental school with practically no debt. Now, here's the other thing that I'll point out. I also worked practically full-time all the time. I was in dental school. I also was married. My wife was teaching uh, full-time. And so we had a very good income. And today, nobody works, Howard. And that's a mistake. If I get the message out there, these dental students, I, I, I hate to say, I almost said kids, but I have to be careful. These dental students have got to shift from a new paradigm. It's OK to work while you're in school. It's OK to work. Have a job. I worked. I drew blood. I drove taxi cab. I worked in medical records. I worked in hematology. I, 
you know, there were all kinds of jobs available. And Bill, they, they every year they take a student loan money and like 5,000 bucks and do spring break in Cancun. Exactly, and it, 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 it's part of that. And I'm telling these kids, and, and they're coming out of school, because it's gonna, and then they're telling them that the only way you can pay off your student debt is to go out and work for corporate dentistry. And I do not like that. It is a trend that I have worked for the last 30 years to work for private practice, fee-for-service, dentistry because I still believe that we deliver the best care to the patient, we're more responsive to the patient, and all these reasons. They can't pay off their student debt, Howard, working for 100 to 150,000 a year. I mean, do the math. I mean, do the math on 350, and I just spoke at Midwest University recently to the students there, the graduating class. These kids are $400,000 in debt. Well, do the math. At 5%, they're gonna pay that off in 10 years. That's 40,000 in principal. <coughs> Over the period of time, the average is 200,000 uh, at 5%, it's so another 10, that's a $50,000 a year payment. And 40,000 of that is taxable. So let's take their 150 a year, and that's generous. New graduates in the urban areas aren't even making 150. Um, but if they're making 150, the first expense is taxes. Taxes are gonna take 40,000 of that. Now we're down to 110, they pay $40,000 in student loan, or 50,000 in student loan, What's that leave them? 60,000 to live on? <laughs> That's not gonna work. They'd be better off to have not gone to school and work as a dental assistant if they're gonna do that. Their only way is to go out and buy a practice and get in and start making some money. They cannot pay off that debt. And the banks are still loaning money, and I think with good, good advice, I've advised banks to loan money to these students, and, and they get a call, I won't say weekly, but every, at least once a month, they get a call from a banker that says, Bill, you've been in dentistry a long time. I've got a student here and he's got $400,000 student loan. He wants to buy a practice for a million dollars. I said, tell me about the practice. And I say, generally, let's, I said, I said, well, Mr. Banker, let's pull out paper and pencil, let's do some math. And it generally works. It generally works. We can generally pay off the student loan and we can pay off the practice and actually have a pretty good standard of living if they'll do that. But if they follow what the dental schools are teaching um, and going into corporate dentistry or get a job, they're in trouble. They're gonna have a real hard time. Well, you do math in your head as quick as I, I do. I, but I also think it's, there's something different about this generation. Like, um, I didn't have a car my first five years of college. My, my youngest son is uh, 19, he didn't have a car. Mm -hmm. And you go to these dental schools and they all drive thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 new cars. They do spring break every year to Cancun. I, I never went to Cancun on no, student loan. No, I didn't know where Cancun was. And, and yeah, and so a lot of these deals, I, I look at the variance. I mean, how come some kids are getting out with 150, yeah. and then the average might be 300, and then there's kids with 450, 500, and then they act like they're a victim. They're like, oh, well. No, I, and I, and I, as you know, my daughter's a dentist, and she graduated. She actually went back to school at uh, 31 and decided to become a dentist. And she already had two, uh, she had gone to school here in Tucson, um, fashion merchandising, worked at Nordstrom for a year, got a second degree in uh, commercial interior architecture, designed medical offices for six years, and at 31 came to me and said, Dad, I think I'll go to dental school. Now, she already had, uh, and she was married, her husband's an architect, and they don't make much money, architects don't make a lot, but um, she decided to go to dental school, and when she graduated, I mean, she had between 150 and 200 of debt, and most of that was to my wife and I. So it puts her in a little different situation. But they didn't live as lavishly. I mean, you, you won't believe this, but she and her husband had one car, and so she walked to school. He dropped her off in the morning. She walked home every night for four years. Uh, it was a good exercise for her, and she didn't need a separate car. But you go to the parking lot at the dental school, and like you say, you're seeing 30, 40,000. And what I also think is bizarre, bizarre, okay, so when I got out of school um, in May of 87, um, there was, um, two offices and I worked at. One was seven to one, Monday through Sunday, mm -hmm. and the other one was from one to 10, um, Monday through Sunday, seven days a week. So I worked, I worked seven a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week, and it took four months to get my office open, so I just quit my day job. So I opened up my office, I was seven to one, seven days a week, mm -hmm. and every night for the first year, yeah. at one o'clock I went to the other one. So I worked seven a.m. to um, 10 p.m., seven days a week, the first year, and with all the complaining about student loans, for me in Phoenix, I ran an ad to hire a dentist to come in on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, well, I'm not working Saturday. Right, yep. It's like, you're not, you have $300,000 <laughs> student loans and you won't work Saturday? I know. It, I, I work it, seven days a week. Yeah. And didn't, oh my God. Well, we can reminisce about that, and that's a big issue, I believe. But I think the bigger thing, the bigger picture that we need to look at here is let's go back to my abundance for a moment. See, what I see today in dentistry 
this is the golden era of dentistry. I mean, this is it. I mean, this is, it's never been better. It's never been this good. I mean, think about it. They think, well, it was great back then, but here's the thing. What did we have available for services? Well, we, we, we did fillings. We were just barely making the shift into composites. I mean, composites at that time, insurance companies wouldn't even pay for a composite. Most dental schools weren't teaching composites. I actually took my amalgamators out of the office in 1980, and I never did an amalgam. I, somebody, I went to a course, and he said, put the amalgamators in the trunk of your car and take the bus to work. Well, I put the amalgamators in the trunk of my car and rode my bicycle the next day. No more silver fillings. Those were available. Then we had crowns. Think about the crowns we had. We had gold crowns and porcelain fused to metal crowns, and, 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 I, and I'm not to throw cold water on anybody, but they never looked really good. And, and if a tooth was missing, if we had to remove a tooth, uh, the only solution was to put in a bridge, and which meant you had to prep the teeth on either, you know, well, you know, I mean, all of that sort of thing. And think about today what's available in dentistry. First <laughs> off, we shifted from dentistry being remedial. You know, when I graduated, you know, people would say, well, I hardly ever go to a dentist. I went to a dentist once. I had the tooth ache, had the tooth removed. I haven't, had to, haven't needed a dentist since. Like, and that's all the public thought of when they thought of dentistry was relief of acute pain. When wait till we get advanced periodontal disease and have our teeth removed and make a denture. Well, truthfully, uh, I had to promise head of our prosthetics department uh, that I would never make a denture, and if I made him that promise, he would graduate me because I hated dentures. I didn't like doing them. But look what's available today. We've got, first off, we've got, healthy, we've got a healthy public. They're living a good 15 years longer, and they're hanging on to their teeth, so huge opportunity there that wasn't available then. Secondly, we've got cosmetics came in. Cosmetics came in and made the American public aware that, a, that their smile actually has something to do with their success in life, and the public is now, at least in the United States, is thinking along these lines, and some of the other countries are following along, so that's available. And then implants have absolutely changed dentistry. I mean, the fact that we can now remove a diseased tooth and place an implant and place a restoration on that is something we didn't have available to us, although I did join an implant study club in 1972 and started placing blade implants back there in the early 70s. Um, and most of them worked, most of them worked, but uh, I think the opportunity is really here. The business model today is so much better than the business model was in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. I mean, today, I look at what my clients are doing. I mean, I just look at what my clients are doing today. And I have clients that are earning, you know, that are earning a seven-figure income, a net income, from the practice of dentistry, and they're doing this in a three to a four-day work week. They're doing this and they're taking, you know, eight to ten weeks off a year, which is kind of my trademark, is that life is first and your practice is something to support your life, not life takes what's left over after you've worked a lot. Um, I think the opportunity in dentistry today is, is greater than it's ever been in the past. I, I really do. Yeah, and I, I want to throw one more perspective out there. Um, the weirdest um, experiences you, I, I feel personally is, um, you know, I, I love lecturing around mm -hmm. the world. I've lectured in every continent several times, and I've lectured in 50 countries. And you'll come back from uh, um, Africa or Asia, or you know, you'll come back mm -hmm. from, you know, where you know, seven billion people, three billion make, live off three dollars yep. a day. And then the minute you land, you start hearing all these Americans talk about how bad everything is, <laughs> and how bad the government is. And, and I, I, I was listening to this guy telling me about how our government, you know, it's all bribes and cheating. And I, I, I was sitting there thinking, well, if that's what they do, then that's what everyone should do. Because <laughs> I've been to all those other places, and I'm always really, really glad to get back here. And then when you read history books, I go back when, you know, people think it's so tough now. And I go back, and so, so in 1862, uh, almost a million Americans are killed in the, in the yeah. Civil War. And then we go into World War I, which coincides with the Spanish influenza. So the flu kills 5% of the entire planet, <laughs> plus World War I. Mm -hmm. Then we slip into a Great Depression. Then we go into World War II, and now people are whining about 2015. Well, here you just want to look at them and say, <laughs> you should have to live in Asia for at least a month a year, or Africa. Or, or go back 100 years in time, because I, 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 I mean, at some point you just got to call bullshit. You know, I, as you know, I belong to a, a coaching program. Uh, I've been, you know, I, as I, you know, I coach doctors, and I believe that coaching is important. And I've been a member of a program called Strategic Coach for eight years. And with Dan by, Sullivan. With Dan Sullivan. And, and one of the mantras that we have at Strategic Coach is we always go big. Always go big means always begin in gratitude. Now, something my wife and I have done for years is in the morning, 
uh, before we get up, we, we talk about the things that we have to be grateful for. How much, if, you, if, you, if you live here, see, I, I, I work at this. I work at living in abundance. I, I work at not coming from scarcity. And I think the normal uh, human situation is to always come from scarcity. And if you think about this, uh, I, I believe the world's divided into two groups. And the people on Occupy Wall Street kind of put the numbers on it, you know, the 5% and the 95%. Well, I've always felt this way. It actually, a uh, quick story, it started one time I'd flown my plane down to Mexico, and uh, we were in Loreto on the Baja, and we we're sitting around the pool one afternoon. By Cabo? Uh, north of Cabo, yes. Okay, north, north of Cabo. Cabo. Loreto's about halfway down the peninsula. Okay. And uh, we were sitting around the pool one afternoon, and uh, this little funky little motel. It wasn't even a hotel, it was just a little motel, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you didn't even want to get in the pool, and so we sat around having a beer instead of getting in the pool. <laughs> the water didn't look too good. And uh, there was a fellow there named Malcolm Smith. And now Malcolm Smith, uh, uh, is a very famous uh, and, and very small group of people on motorcycle racing. Malcolm Smith, uh, and this dates me a little bit, goes back to uh, uh, sometimes any Sunday was there, any time given Sunday, I think was the name of the movie, uh, Steve McQueen. He was an advisor to Steve McQueen in the last um, there was a movie that uh, Steve McQueen escaped from jail, a prisoner of war camp, and rode across. And you, remember, you remember the scene, and he, he jumps on this motorcycle and he jumps a fence. Well, that was actually Malcolm Smith on the motorcycle. It wasn't Steve McQueen. Anyway, he was leading a group of people down the Baja on motorcycles, and they had an, a helicopter on standby and an ambulance and all this stuff. And uh, I remember, wow, you know, this really sounds great. And we got talking about various adventures we'd been on, and he said, yep. He says about 5% of the people in the world do everything. You're the 95% watch us on TV. I said, aha, I'm always going to be in the 5%. Now, this is not money. It's enjoyment. It's level of relationships. It's physical fitness. It's, it's just everything about life. Well, then when I start with Dan Sullivan, he starts talking about the 5% see the world from abundance, and 95% see it from scarcity. So these students or anybody can be a dentist, but I mean, I talk to dentists from my age, and they also still in scarcity. There's not enough out there for them. I mean, look at the population of the United States in 1970 compared to now. Look at the disposable income of people in 1970 compared to now. This is the opportunity for dentists. It's not the fact that there are more dentists graduating, the fact they've got this debt. When has the American public ever had the disposable income that they have right now? Now, I'm talking disposable income. As you know, I was just in Tanzania. And, and then I followed you on we're, that we're one. Both, we're both, yeah. we, both, uh, we both climbed Kilimanjaro yeah. in 2014. In 2014. The tallest and, mountain in Africa. The tallest mountain in Africa. 19,000 feet. It was 19,000 feet. And uh, uh, you did it. You were smart. You did it in your 50s. I did it in my 70s. So it was, uh, <laughs> but it was good. I, I was able to I beat at the top. And I was the first one on our group back down to the, the, the high camp. So I felt good about that. But you go to Tanzania, and you see what these people have. And I've been, as like you, I've been all over the world. In the United States, we've got it made. Oh my God. T disposable income. And I had a financial advisor early in my career, Rick Mercer, who, you know, you know Rick Mercer. And, uh, and, and he said, you know, you want to remember that anything beyond a third of a bowl of rice a day is a luxury. And he oh, says, my, and his evidence was, and my wife and I just looked at him like he's crazy. And he said, my evidence is a third of the world lives, or two thirds of the world lives on a, a bowl of rice a day. And so look at what we spend money on today. And, and it really changed your mind because I came back from Tanzania and somebody complained because I left the toilet seat up. <laughs> like, do you <laughs> realize that three billion people, their toilet is a pipe in the no, ground? Or, or, and actually there's a large number of people who don't even have a pipe. They've just got a hole in the ground. And I, was like, yeah. I was like, okay, I just got back. I mean, I flew to Kathmandu 20 hours and went to the first class business section of the international airport of Kathmandu and the toilet was a, a hole pipe, in the, hole, was a in the hole in the ground. <laughs> and then you come back to this rich, fat, lazy country, and, and they had to move the toilet seat. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm so sorry the crisis. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but speaking of abundance, I gotta tell you something, uh, in all honesty, whenever I meet a dentist who does work four days a week and he's doing a million and a half or uh, more and taking home five, six hundred thousand dollars, he's usually your client. A lot of them are. So, yeah. so, uh -huh. so I, I'm gonna walk through um, mm. to the people who, um, Pretend, um, pretend I was, uh, or, or talk to the viewer about what do you do for dentists? What, what are your logistics? Mm -hmm. How does your consulting program work? How are you different than others? I mean, I know you and I um, have always been biased against uh, real dentists who have 
than dentists ran practices because a lot of consultants um, you can tell they, they don't even have a prototype for what they're talking about. I mean, they'll they'll say something, and my 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 bullshit factor is like, so do, do you own an office where you actually do this? And they're like, no, I, I I lecture at conventions and I write articles for magazines, but I like real guys like us because we got a freaking prototype. I mean, and and, and if it does, and I know that you um, the same thing. If it wouldn't work in Corvallis, Oregon. Well, you wouldn't tell some guy in Kansas to do it. Right. I mean, you you and I worked this crap out in real prototypes, well, uh, but tell people what you do. Yeah, here, here's why. I, I think the thing is, that where I, I'm really different. First off, I went into dentistry. I grew up on a dairy farm. You know, a dairy farm is seven days a week, 365 days a year, and you get up and milk those cows, and, and then you work, put in a full work day, and then you milk the cows again. And so growing up, you know, my family, uh, I have two brothers, uh, and my, my parents, and uh, we went on two vacations while I was growing up. We went one time, <laughs> we took a week off, somehow my dad arranged, I was in the second grade, and we went to Yellowstone Park for a week. And uh, again, I was in about high school, junior high, and we took three or four days to the Oregon coast, and that was it. And I said, there's gotta be a better way to make a living. And actually, my mother uh, reminded me of this uh, several times. She said it was a day. Sorry. That's cool that the message for clumped you. But, this is, you know, my mom told me this for years. It was actually on a hay baler one day in the desk. And she said, I said to her, there's got to be a better way to make a living than this. And she told me that right until she was 92 years old. And I believe I found it. So I looked around to find a better way to make a living. What would be a great living? Now, I want to make a difference for people. I just didn't, it wasn't just all about money. I mean, there's a lot of ways to make a lot of money. And I found one. I mean, I've found, I've done well in dentistry and I've done well in this. But I wanted to help people. But I wanted to be in control. I wanted to be able to control my time. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, time is the only thing on this planet that we're short of. There's a finite amount that we get. And every one of us has got a certain amount of time. And when it's over, depending on your religious leanings, as far as I'm concerned, on this planet, it's over. So I wanted control of that time, and so I looked around, and dentistry was really good. I wanted to be a veterinarian, and my, our veterinarian discouraged me, and I talked to four or five dentists, and they all had pretty good uh, control, and so I said, well, dentistry is good. But I got into dentistry because it looked like a good business. I mean, it was a really pretty simple business, and I know you've got your new book out, How to Uncomplicate Dentistry. I looked at dentistry. It's the most simple business in the world. I mean, people don't get this. I mean, think about it. We've got about six things we do. Dentists tell me they don't know their fees. And I say, come on, you only do six things, learn them. Of course, I turn to hygienists and they say, you only do four things, learn the fees for heaven's sakes. That's a simple business. We treat, people come in, they've got an issue, we find out what their problem is, we find out what they want, but we find out their bigger picture of what they want long term, and then we provide a solution. They write us a check, we do the treatment, and then they promise to come back in six months. <laughs> Can you think of a business like that? Not even a restaurant gets you to promise to come back in tomorrow and have dinner, but we do that and we run it out of you know, generally one location, it's real simple. So we sit down with the dentist and we say, okay, what would you like your life to be? And I say, if we were sitting here together, Howard, 20 years from now, you'll be 72, I'll be 92. And your dad lived to be 92. My dad lived to 92 and my uh, So you my better mother, be alive in 20 years. Uh, I'm gonna be alive uh, uh, in my... Uh, my mother and father both lived in 92, and uh, they were healthy until about the last two years. My wife's mother lived to 100, and she was healthy until about her last two years. So we've got some longevity. But I'm going to sit here and say, okay, Howard, we're sitting here 20 years from now, looking back at your life. What would be the highlights that you would like to bring up? What are the highlights that you would like to bring up? What are the things that you, that you see yourself doing? What are the things that you see you and your four boys? What are you, not, this is not about business, this is about your life. What are the things that you want? What's the legacy that you want to leave your family? I'm not talking money now, I'm just talking experiences, uh, training, values. What are the things you'd like to leave behind? So we start with that. And then we say, and, and then we get into, the, okay, let's talk financial. What would, financial situation you'd like over the next 20 years. All right, now, now we've got that figured out. Let's say, okay, now let's design a b dental practice to support that. In other words, see, I believe in, in dentistry, this is, this is where we're so fortunate. In dentistry, we can create a business. We can create a practice to support almost anything we want. I mean, you think about it. There aren't too many businesses like this, but in dentistry, you tell me what you want and we'll figure out how to do it. So 
we don't have a cookie cutter. So I have clients that work over 200 days a year. I, I think last year my doctor that worked the least worked 106 days. Incidentally, so um, the range is 106 to 200. Over 200. So that's a 100 percent variance. Exactly. And the interesting thing is, the two doctors I'm thinking of currently, their gross income was the same. Their gross was the same, but one really likes to work, and one young, <laughs> he's got two young children and a, a family, and he and he just came back from Argentina. Uh, he was in Europe a few, about two months ago. Goes to Europe about three times a year, and he's ex providing these experiences, and he's and he's doing two million dollars. I mean, it's not like he's just barely getting by. He's do, grossing $2 million in a small town uh, in Oregon. Uh, his net is uh, roughly 45% uh, of that, so around nine, $900,000. And he worked 106 days last year. That's a pretty nice life. <laughs> the, funny, the funniest reason why someone would be a dentist is Mike Detola. His dad closed every August. They went to Hawaii oh. every August. And he said, I'm going to be a dentist because they get to go to Hawaii every month of August. <laughs> Howard, you probably didn't know this. I've never worked in August. I have not worked in August since 1974. And, and I'll tell the, the viewers this, I, I started this and uh, we, we, I practiced in a college town, uh, Oregon State University, and every summer- Is that the Ducks? Uh, no, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am out of here. Which one's- which The one's, Beavers. No, the Beavers, okay. <laughs> out of 50-50 chance and blew it. <laughs> That's right, so anyway, uh, uh, so uh, it, it, they roll up, uh, summer term was over and they literally rolled up the streets. And, and what city is this? Corvallis? Corvallis, 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 Oregon. And wasn't there a president of the American Dental Association? Uh, there was. From Corvallis? Bill Tampas was from yeah, Corvallis. he was from Corvallis, uh -huh. okay. And, um, and all the dentists sat around, you know, from, again, from scarcity, and they were all grumping about how slow it was and all this sort of thing. And so, you know, we just got to thinking, uh, my, this is my wife and I got to thinking, it was totally against conventional wisdom. And we didn't tell our parents, of course, because, you know, we were just getting our practice started. And of course, you know, both our parents came from this background of work, 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 and if you're not here, you're going to go broke. And, uh, and so we decided that we would, uh, uh, our daughter was 18 months old, and we decided we'd go to Alaska for five weeks. So nice. we, lo we loaded up our Chevy Blazer with all our camping gear, and I love to fish, and so we loaded up all the stuff, and we got on the ferry uh, in Seattle and went, drove to Alaska, and we drove all around Alaska, camped and fished, and came home. And, and we came home, and I always tell this to our, our audiences in our, in our seminars, I came home, the checkbook was overdrawn, and um, the appointment book was empty, and we survived. And I thought, you know, if I can survive this year, just a few years out of school, I could probably do this every year on, from then on. So we did. We took every summer, off, every August off, and we just closed. So again, it's, do I see the town is quiet, and everybody's left, and there's no business, or do I see an opportunity? And what I saw was an opportunity to take a month off. <laughs> so could you drive, did you drive all the way to the Canadian coast to Alaska? No, we took the ferry system to Alaska. The, ferry, the Alaskan ferry system leaves oh, okay. Seattle I'm not and goes, aware up, of that. goes up the Inland Passage to Alaska. You get off in Haines and then you drive across into the Northwest Territories and up into Alaska and then, then we drove wow. all the way home. Yes. That was still my favorite yeah. vacation of all we, time we Alaska. Drove home. As a matter of fact, my wife and I are going to spend three months this summer on our boat. Uh, we have spent three months on our boat now for the last 20 years. Um, but I do business on the boat. I could, you know, I do my business by telephone. So I've got a satellite phone, and where I'm cell phone, I can do my we'll, business. We'll talk more about yeah. that. So, yeah. so if it didn't, so, 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 are, so when someone um, is there any typical new customer client dentist that well, you see? Generally, yes. I mean, is there an age range? Generally, is there a problem there's range? no age range. I have brand new doctors. We have a program for young doctors. We call it our Leap Program where we actually help them is evaluate practice situations to get into. And that's called yeah. your elite? Leap. Leap, Leap. like okay. jump. Yeah. Leap. And we do that for new clients. And actually we did that, and I, I, I do want to plug this. This is our uh, No, no Nons Transitions book, and this is my daughter. Uh, you can see she got her good looks from her mother. And, uh, <laughs> and, and she's a dentist in Portland. And so we, we saw all these students coming out and getting in trouble buying into these practices. And so we, we evaluate practices from a business point of view. But I want to go back to this, this thing about uh, our clients. So then we figure out the simplest business plan that we can figure out for them. You know, you want to make half a million dollars. Well, let's figure that out. How much do you want your overhead to be? Well, the, everybody says the magic 50%. So you need to do a million dollars of production. All right. How much vacation time would you like? Because I'm really big on vacation time. Because I, you see, I shifted my paradigm. This, this is a huge paradigm shift. This, if, if you're, if, if you people listening to this get nothing else out of this podcast but this. In the old paradigm from the Industrial Revolution, back, we're talking 
200 years or 100 years ago, vacations were doled out as a reward for hard work. In other words, you come to work for my company, and if you work here and you show up for work every day, I'll give you a week's paid vacation at the end of a year. And if you work for me two years, I'll give you two weeks vacation and, and so forth, and it caps out somewhere in the three-week range for most workers. And if for that paradigm, you have got to shift out of that. Vacations are actually preparation for effective work. You see, when I came back from Alaska, five weeks break, I mean, I came back first September, I mean, I was full of it. I had so much energy, I was just ready to get going. And all these other dentists in town, you see, were beaten down and oh me and how bad things are because I had a terrible August. Well, I came back and all the students came back to town just like I knew they would. <laughs> 20,000 students come back into town just like they do every year like clockwork and I'm just, I'm, hey, I'm excited, I'm ready to go to work and they're all compl still complaining about their bad August. And so vacations are preparation to be productive. So we teach our clients that. That's a huge part. You see, I've studied dentists, I've studied dentists for 40 years and I've looked at a number of days, days of the week. And I look at one factor. You know, you know you, you, you've got an MBA and you study a lot of figures in dental practices. I look at numbers too. There are some numbers that are really critical, and one of the most critical factors beyond how much you want to net and how much you want to spend to do it, how much dentistry do you present to patients on a daily basis? You see, I've got this theory, and it's just a theory. If I give you an opportunity to have something done, like for example, putting an implant in for that missing tooth, or putting veneers on those scraggly brown teeth you've got in the front, if I give you the opportunity, if I let you know that's available, you might do it. But if you don't know it's available, <coughs> there's no chance you will do it. So one of the things that I coach my doctors on every day is how much dentistry do you present to patients? Now, of course, my, you've been listening to me for years, so you know this, but my idea is that nobody needs any of this dentistry. We don't even need our teeth. And my evidence always is telling patients that my grandparents live long, useful lives without teeth, and therefore everything is optional. So we, but we would only present dentistry that we'd present to our own family, but at the same time, if I present it, it might get done. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. If I don't present it, it won't get done. So I studied on 62 doctors, actually these were in Western Canada, uh, and I watched them for two years. And I checked, I kept track of diagnosis per day, in other words, dentistry we presented, and I did it on day, I graphed that against days of the week. Well, I found Monday was always the best day. Tuesday, Wednesday, pretty good. By Thursday, it's dropping off. And this is back when dentists were working five days a week. And I found Friday, they're, they're losing it. This is when they walk into hygiene and the hygienist says, <laughs> you know, I've been talking to Howard about a crown on number 30 and you're tired and you're worn out and you don't want to do it. And you're afraid if you say yes, I'll have to do it. And you want to say no, I'll have to talk you into it. So it's easier to say, let's watch it. So I watched this on these doctors. And then I studied the same thing on weeks sense of vacation. And I found dramatic drop between six and eight weeks on 62 doctors. And now I've been studying that for 30 years, and it's still true. So what makes sense here? Don't work five days. As a matter of fact, we're finding that our most productive doctors are working a three-day work week. And as one of my clients, and uh, I take doctors on trips uh, all over, uh, as you know, and uh, I was on a trip with one of my doctors, and uh, he had worked about 110 days. And one of the other fellows on the trip was working about 120 days, and their production was the same. And he was a little, the, the one that worked the extra 10 or 15 days was a little concerned. And, and, and this doctor made a quote, which is, is really good. And he said that if I can do a $15,000 day, if I, can do, if I can produce $15,000 in a day, why would I do three fives? Why would I do three $5,000 days? Or why would I do a 10 and a five if I can do 15 in one day? Well, I mean, those numbers sound phenomenal, but, you know, if you're doing general dentistry, crown and bridge, and you're doing some implants, and you're doing, you know, just, you, it's easy to do a $15,000 day for him. But a lot of doctors are sitting in their office doing this and doing three $4,000 days. The same client said, and I believe in a daily production goal. I, I really believe in this. And but you, you've got to schedule to something. And he says, if I'm not booked a goal every single day I'm in my office, I'm working too many days. You see, there's a difference between demand and capacity, as, as we know. I mean, we can increase capacity, but that doesn't always increase more demand. So we teach these, we set up a model then for these clients, how to do this. We, set up, we drop a model for them and say, does this work for you? Because it's got to be their model. They've got to they've go home and do it. 
And then what I do is I coach them, and I have two other people that coach with me, and we coach them on a monthly basis. You know, here are your goals for this month, how'd you do? And then I put on a couple seminars for them during the year, two days apiece. And then I send a consultant into their office as well to do the details. I, I don't get involved in the minutia details, but how much, um, to do a dollars with a dentistry, how much do you think you have to present? Well, that's, you know, that's an interesting statistic. I can give you 100% acceptance rate. And I always ask this in seminars. I, I put your hand up if you'd like to have 100% acceptance. And then I relay a story of a practice I went to in India one time, and he had 100% case acceptance. And he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to have that. And I said, well, it's just real simple. Let me tell you how he works. We got to his office at 10 o'clock in the morning, and there was a line down the street. And you've been to India, you know. This was a, this was a small town about halfway between Bangalore and the west coast of, Calcutta, of Cal Calicut. And um, all he did was extractions. Lines that line up down the, down the street, and you walk in, he unlocks the door, he lets the first 10 people in. And they sit in the bench, and he goes down the row, and he says, can you point to one that hurts today? And they point to a tooth, and you want it out this morning? Uh-huh. He goes to the next person. Which one hurts today? Want it out this morning? Uh-huh. He gets 100% case acceptance. So I said, if you want very high case acceptance, don't present it much dentistry. Just present basics. I say, if you're going to present ideal treatment, now to me, again, ideal treatment is what I would do for my own family. Now, I have my mouth. I have 28 units of bonded porcelain that was done by one of my clients, Dr. Rice Bohr, about 18 years ago. So to me, that was ideal. Does anybody need this? Absolutely not. But if you present <coughs> treatment that is ideal, now understand, I had a bunch of posterior fillings and you know, all that stuff. But anyway, if you present what's ideal, I say three to one is a pretty good ratio. Three to one. But again, I hate to put a, a number on that because it's all dependent upon what you present. You know, like I talked to a new client, and do you do cosmetics? Oh yeah. Well. Uh, how often do you present veneers? Oh, all the time. How many did you do last year? Now, I happen to have his printout because when you come to this, oh, I, I forgot one thing that we do. We always meet personally, face to face, with a new client for almost six hours in this conversation about where do you want to go and how do we, we design a plan for them. I've got all their information. I said, well, right here, doctor, it says you only did five veneers last year. How many did you really present last year? Well, obviously, the answer is, not very many. I said, what if you presented a set of veneers a month? What do you think would happen? Well, you'd probably do one every other month. Well, what if you presented a set of veneers every week? Well, you'd probably do at least one or two a month. Well, what do you suppose if you had that conversation with a patient? Now I'd, now I'd have to be talking to a patient with a good new patient flow or a large recall program. What if you, you or your hygienist had that conversation with a patient every day? what would happen? So you see, it's really a matter of how much opportunity your patients have. And again, it's like this abundance. They're buying new cars. They're buying, I mean, look at that television set. You know that in the depth of the recession, 2008, 2009, that about 70% of American homes swapped out their television set for a large flat panel screen? In the depth of the recession, we made a complete shift to television sets across America. And we're talking, <laughs> totally discretionary, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've all seen the phenomena that um, I mean, in the '80s, um, LVI was a big thing, and these dentists would go to LVI and Bill Dickerson to get them all fired up, and so they would come home and they'd be charged up. So they would sell the bejesus out of veneers for a year or two, and then at, after about two years, they weren't doing any. They weren't mentioning it. Because they lost their enthusiasm. And, and, it, and you hit it right on the head. It was not because of the recession in 2008 and 2009. It was because we quit making it available to our patients. Yeah. I mean, just like yesterday. We, we come to Phoenix. We, we had a rental car. We got this little Camaro convertible, and it's got a heads-up display. Now, my wife just got a new Tahoe, I mean, like a month ago. It doesn't have the heads-up display for the directions. <laughs> she wow, how come our car doesn't have this? Now, we're thinking all of a sudden, she's gotta have this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's America. Yeah. And if they know it's available, see, I didn't know the heads up display was available or the Tahoe would have it. Didn't know it was available. And, and I, I saw this my whole career, you know, I signed up for the AGD and got yeah. my MAGD and, and uh, FAGD and MAGD. And you would go to a course, I remember I went to a, um, a course by um, uh, G. John Shulver, you learn how to do mm -hmm. apicoectomies. I'd never done one, you know, 
in my first 30 years of existence. Now you're doing them all the time. Uh, you, you go to a uh, Carl Mish course, next thing you know, you're, you're doing sinus lifts and bone grafts and, and, and um, you know, it's just, um, the, the, what, so what I'm hearing you say is that if you're working five days a week and you're burned out and you're tired yep. and you're going in on a hygiene check and say, oh, you looks good. Exactly. Whereas the guy that's taken off uh, three day weekends or four day weekends and is going in there pumped and jacked and ready to go and presenting all the things that could be happening. Because I agree, mm -hmm. the dentistry, you know, when, when you hear an orthodontist, they come back and they say, well, um, well, the orthodontist said my child has to have it because he has a malocclusion. I say, really, he has to have it? Well, go back <laughs> and have the orthodontist stick his finger in between your child's teeth and tell your child to bite as hard as he can. You know, I mean, I mean, my, my mom and three brothers didn't walk out of high school with one tooth. Uh -huh. I remember, I remember one time at my, my, my dad had, um, uh, yeah, there's so many uncles and uh, most of them didn't have any um, teeth or dentures and they would be sitting there eating almonds oh, on edentulous ridges. Listen, so, so I, all of this is luxury it, stuff. It's all luxury stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and that's good. Well, but you know, going back to this and, and the other thing that happens when a doctor starts working three days or four days and takes eight or ten weeks off, I, when I say vacation, I'm talking time out of the office. I'm time out of the office. But here's one of the things that I see. These big producers I work with, and I mentioned to you earlier, I've got a group from my big docs meeting coming up. And these guys are all doing at least 1.6 on up to about three and a half million. These are single doctors, no associates, and they're all doing this in a reasonable number of days. And they're all doing barely like the three million, three. So and a one and a, one and a half million a year on reasonable days. What's reasonable days? Hundred about a hundred uh, about a hundred and twenty to hundred and forty somewhere in that. Hundred twenty to hundred and forty. And at a million and a half, they yeah. generally have about four staff members. And Just uh, four, two assistants, yeah, two, two hygienists, one assistant, one on the front. And I find and a million and a half. Yes. It was, yeah. And what would their average overhead be? Fifty, fifty-five percent. Okay, so. So I got, can I comment on that? Yes. Again, that, that, that's a working thing. I mean, these, yes. these dentists that, um, you know, they have to have three, four assistants. They, they can't take an impression. They can't make a temporary. They, 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 they can't take an x-ray. They, 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 so, so if you just have all these staff. Well, I think, see, here's the thing. You, you, you know my history a little bit. I practiced for 20 years and I built up a, you know, I was doing a million dollars in 1985. And if you remember, you don't know this. Well, you did. You got out of school at that time. So crowns were two, 275. Three hundred dollars, and where I practice, and and I'm doing a million dollars. Well, that was a lot of dentistry in those days. Still a lot of dentistry, but uh, still a lot of dentistry. But now that would be about a three million dollar practice. But I started that, and I did it by merging a couple practices together, and that was my growth strategy, which is still a fantastic growth strategy. Is to buy another practice and merge the uh, the patient base. But um, I've, I had a big staff, and then I did, then the next year I did that with half the staff. I mean, I had this little epiphany because I, I made a million dollars and uh, uh, I made 300,000 net. Um, my buddy across the parking lot uh, did 600,000 and he made 300,000 net. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, who's so smart here? Well, the story we won't go into, but anyway, I, over a period of about uh, three weeks, I cut my staff in half and we still did the million dollars the following year. So I've been known for 25 years of figuring out systems that we can get by on a small team. You know, a, a very small team. And so I've, I've worked with, you know, I work with the clinical side. How can we be efficient here? How can a dentist do uh, a million to a million and a half with one dental assistant? Well, so you just hit it right on the head right there. Maybe you don't need someone to do every single thing for you. Maybe you can't go to your private office and get on the internet and play games for two hours during the day, but my, you don't come to office to play games. You come to office to do dentistry. You play games on Thursday and Friday when you're off. At the front desk, for example, here's a real simple thing. I, I mean, think about what goes on at the front desk. How can we simplify it? Well, if a number of years ago I walked into an Apple store and uh, uh, you know, I walked into the Apple store and I picked out my computer and the, the young man, he's got, you know, he's got a, a, a dreadlocks and piercings and tattoos, sleeves and all this, and he pulls out his smartphone and says, how would you like to take care of that day, sir? And I pull out my credit card, and he swipes the card, and he says, would you like your receipt emailed to you? And, he goes, tch, tch, tch. and my phone rings in my pocket, and I've got an email with a receipt. And I said, wow, that is neat. And it was about two weeks later, I go to the Nordstrom store in Portland, and I buy something, and the sales associate pulls out his smartphone, swipes my card, and I get an email <laughs> standing there, and I said, how can we do this in a dental office? Now think about this, real simple thing. What is the area, where do we send most, where do most dental offices, what service do we provide where we send out most of our statements? Hygiene. Hygiene. 
So I'm the hygienist. I figure up for hygiene visit day, and I say, Howard, your fee today is $200. How would you like to take care of that? And you say, well, can I put that on my credit card? Absolutely. Howard, I need your autograph right here. The yellow copy's yours. Ka-ching! Think of the steps we just eliminated. Now, since we've already made the appointment, the next appointment for that patient in hygiene, the next step is to collect the money in hygiene. And now you, as the patient, think about this for customer service. If Apple, who's, you know, they're taking over the computer world, the consumer computer world, and Nordstrom, who did very well during the recession, known for customer service, if it's good enough for Nordstrom and Apple, dental offices, hello, we do it. Now, I, first I get pushback from the high, oh, we, do, we can't do that. We don't, we don't know our fees. I see you do four things, learn them. It's not too hard. You, you got through high. I want to yeah. go back to yeah. something you said yeah. uh, 45 minutes ago. Um, I've always thought it was strange when uh, kids were coming out of school and they would say, um, you know, there'd be like th three, pra you know, they want to go back to uh, Topeka, Kansas. That's where they're from. Mm -hmm. And there's three practices for sale. And one's for 200, one's for 300, and one's for 400. And they always want to buy the, the, the cheapest uh -huh. one. And you said something very interesting that, um, and I, I always thought that was crazy because if you bought, if there were three houses for sale and one was a thousand square feet and one was 2,000 square feet and one was 3,000 square feet, well, if you had three kids, you would get the 3,000 square foot. And then at the end of the 30 years of your house, you, you still had a 3,000 square foot home to sell. I mean, you're buying a, a, a house that, that's bigger. And if you have a lifestyle, let's say you come out of school and say, say you're Mormon and you, you want to have five kids and you want to you have a 4,000 square foot home and a stay home wife and, and you decide, I, I really want to make $400,000, then you would be saying, well, then you don't want to buy a $200,000 no. product. You want to buy a million dollars because what you're buying is a cash flow. Right. And, and so if you are a single guy and you don't want to get married and you just want to have a Harley Davidson and play four days a week. Well, you might only need a little practice and a little condo, but so you need to buy a cash flow. So your daughter, um, and you guys wrote this book. And so I want to go back to leap. What are, um, and then you also mentioned mergers and acquisitions, which is a very common strategy in the fortune 500. Yes. They're always doing yeah. mergers and acquisitions. So can we talk about well, yeah. buying and selling practices yeah. for kids yeah. out of school? Uh, absolutely. This, this is, I'm, I'm glad we came to this. This is one of my favorite subjects. You, you talk about the 200, the 300 and the, and the $400,000. I'd probably advise them to buy both these. And I've done this. I've had people starting their practice and they'll buy two practices. And, and if they can, they'll, work, they'll, they'll merge them into one office. They'll pick out the nicest physical facility or the nicest location in town and merge those two practices. Now you've got something. That little practice is very difficult to actually make the cash flow work and pay off that student loan. That million dollar practice, absolutely, we'll do that. We'll look at that. A couple of the pitfalls that we've run into on this, and this is something that's occurring, there are a lot of baby boomers right now that are getting ready to retire, and, and, and people are telling them, brokers in particular, are tell, and people are doing transition seminars. They're appealing to the practicing dentist, sell your practice, and you stay on as the associate. Well, that is just total baloney. I've got a one doctor practice this week, and next week it's gonna support two doctors? One with a million dollars of debt? No, it's not gonna work. So I always ask, I have two questions I always say to a doctor who's thinking about bringing in an associate or selling part of his practice. And I'll say, doctor, how many patients are you currently turning away? Well, how many patient doctors, I mean, you've got 120,000 doctors in your network. How many of your doctors in Dentaltown are writing in and saying, gosh, I've just got so many patients, I don't know what to do with them. I've got so many new patients, I can't handle None. them. None. That's right. And the second question is, doctor, if I came in as your associate, or if I bought the practice and kept you on as an associate, how much of your personal income would you like to give up? And the answer is the same. None. So I don't understand how we're going to do this. So my best transition, really, in buying a practice is buy the practice, and my daughter just did this. I mean, she just did this. I encouraged her, and uh, she decided where she wanted to practice in Portland, and we actually chose which part of Portland, and she intentionally chose kind of the blue-collar side of the river as opposed to the other side where there's a lot of dentists and everybody's got a big mortgage and a Mercedes and a BMW on lease. And she bought the practice in this little suburb called Milwaukee, and she bought that practice in April of her senior year. We didn't tell anybody at the dental school they frowned on that sort of confidence. <laughs> and she, but her transition was done this way. The senior doctor, the check cleared the bank on a Thursday afternoon or a Friday. He left and she walked in Monday morning, introduced herself to the 
patients. Hello, I'm Christina Blatchford. I'm your new dentist. Thank you for coming in. How can I help you? And we grew that practice 30% the first year. I will also say this, and this will scare some people. Of the existing team members, none of them were there at the end of the first 12 months. And I kind of use the analogy that, you know, when we get a new football coach, and by the way, Oregon State got a new one this year from Wisconsin, you know, the entire coaching staff has changed. We don't keep the offensive coordinator or the, the defensive coach. We don't keep those people. They bring a whole new coaching staff in. And I think there's some merit in that. And then, April, another practice came up for sale two miles away from her. A broker called and said, are you interested in this practice? And she immediately said, yes, I'll take it without even, I mean, she said, yes, I'll take it. And by the way, how did she purchase that practice, the first one? She went in, took a look at it, said, Dad, I want this practice. And I said, why don't you make an offer? Broker was a friend of mine. She said, no, Dad, I really want this practice. I said, well, make a full price offer. So that practice went, for, went that quickly, the other one the same way. And now she's merged these two practices. And what we do is we open the sieve at the bottom. This is a whole other subject. Every practice has the bottom 20% of their patient base. We let them go. We let them go. And now she's doing what the two practices were doing, and she still does it in a three-day work week. One person at the front desk. And when I ask her receptionist, will you need more help at the front desk, she said, absolutely not. Now, we're on a bonus system where they get a percentage, they get 20% of everything we do, so they can divide it by Now, is this all in your book? book? It's all in the book. It's all in your book? And, and how does a viewer, uh, um, my, 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 my viewers, um, what, what I'm hearing is, um, most of these podcasts, uh, most dentists have an hour commute to work. Yeah. And you might first think, well, that's in LA or Phoenix and traffic, but most of them are rural. Like a lot well, of these no, guys. I, I know your clients. A lot you, of your clients in rural areas get on your podcast and they drive in circles for an hour before they go yeah. there just to listen to what you have to say. The, these guys <laughs> tell me that, that they, um, they live in a town of like uh, 7,500 mm -hmm. and they'll have a 70 mile commute to a town of like 650. Exactly. So they're, so, yeah. so if this guy's driving mm -hmm. down the road, we'll have it in the notes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so my, my podcast, it's the only one where we send it to a transcription service. Mm -hmm. So uh, then you log on to Dentaltown, have all the notes, but, uh, uh, but, but how, would, how would someone buy no nonsense transitions? Uh, then you just need to go to Blatchford.com. Go to Blatchford.com, B-L-A-T-C-H-F-O-R-D.com. They should also look up the, the uh, uh, Million Dollar Leap program. That's a, you know, how we've increased practices by And that's on Blatchford.com. It's on Blatchford.com. And another thing I think doctors should look at, and I think one thing that we didn't mention today, is I, I developed a term called retire as you go <laughs> about, I, I introduced it in dentistry about 30 years ago. It's something my wife and I talked about 48 years ago. And that was design our life first and work around it. Design our life and work, in other words, let's design our life and then des design a practice to support that life. And that's rather than working until you're a certain magic age and I got the number in the bank, and I'm going to quit. No, I, I decided, you know, 40 years ago that I'm going to enjoy every single moment. And am I going to die the wealthiest dentist? No. But what's wealth? You know, what is wealth? I mean, to me, it's, happiness and it's health, happiness and health, it's family, it's relationships and enough money to enjoy that and enough money that you don't worry about money. But beyond a certain point, uh, no, Bill, I want to, um, is it okay to ask, like, how much is your consulting service? I mean, well, I, yeah, I have uh, the, the LEAP program that we do is $25,000 for the year, and we will work with a doctor as long as it takes to find that practice. And I, have, I don't get paid on a commission for them making that sale, so, and, I, and no broker has me in their pocket. So I have no, purely objective, this deal will work, this deal won't work. That's how I do. And then I'll work with them for 14 months after that to get them off to a good start. And the LEAP program right. is more kids coming out of school. It's kids coming out of school, okay. yeah. And then my, my coaching program is 59,500. 59, and, uh, and that includes, it's a 14 month program. And then I have an alumni program called Connection and people are paying 499 a month for that program. And I've had people in that 495 program, a month? 495 a month. And that gives them access to us. They can talk to me on a monthly basis. They can come to our seminars. They're on our forum and they have every, all the advantages of being a member, but they just get, but it's, only, it's basically $6,000 a year. And I've had people in that program, I, I just had uh, my longest uh, standing client in that program, I just put him in emeritus status. That is, he, he gets to come to anything we do and I don't charge him anymore. <laughs> And I have several people on that status, but they've been on there 20 some years. Okay, so yeah. so Bill, so okay, I'm, I always try to care my dentist. So, and I only got you for um, I only got you for eight more minutes. I want I want to get more specifics. Um, 
talking, this, this dentist is driving to work and he, he's going to be at work in eight minutes. Um, describe um, this dentist situation who would benefit most from, from your help. Well, I think anybody. What, 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 what's keeping him up at night? What's keeping him up, up at night? night? There are two things. One is they worry about, do I have enough net income? Is my net income, am I being paid for what I'm worth? As hard as I've worked, am I, am I taking home enough? Am I going to take care of my family, put some money away from retirement, and enjoy my life as I go? I think secondly, they're thinking about, I'm just working. I'm working 250 days a year. This is not what I planned on. So the things that I help them with the most, and last year, I don't have the numbers for 2014. 2013, our clients, and we take between 50 and 60 clients a year, and I turn down probably probably a third of the doctors that apply to my program because I, I, for several reasons. But of the ones that joined the program, for 2013, we averaged $150,000 increase in net income. That's, a, that's net per income, doctor. that's per doctor. That's, that's yeah. take home pay at the end of the year. Uh, and we generally drop the number of days they work. I mean, we have seen doctors come in at 240 days. We've seen doctors come in, and I'll take them right on down. I take that 240, I'll take him down to 180 days that first year. So it's 60 more days of free time. Now that gives them time to not only have free time and go out and do things like I enjoyed, like hunting, fishing, kiteboarding, boating, etc. cetera. Um, time for CE, and you mentioned it. There, there's tremendous, CE courses out there they've got to get involved in and learn to increase their skills. But we'll drop the amount of time they work. But I, I think the other thing we do is we dramatically simplify their business. Simplify the business. Now, when I say simplify the business, one of the things that we look at is virtually all of my clients operate at staff overhead at 20% or under of their gross, 20% or under. National average is over 30. Well, there's 10%, I can hand you right here. You're doing a million dollars, you give me $59,000, and when you meet with me for six hours, I'm gonna hand you $100,000 back in staff savings this year. Okay, so, well, let me, let me pin you down on a couple more specifics. So th this kid's coming out of school $300,000 in debt, and everything he reads in all the dental journals that he immediately, after $300,000 student loans, needs $150,000 Sarah CAD CAM, a $150,000 three-dimensional CBCT deal, and a $50,000 laser. So now he just doubled his dental school debt. Do you buy in that you need $300,000 more no, 3D CBCT? I don't. Okay. I don't buy that at all. For example, I, you know, I, I, my daughter, I'm my daughter, I mean, she just ordered a CIRAC. I think the technology is wonderful. Many of my clients have CIRAC. I'm, I'm wild about the technology. But if you're not doing a million dollars a year and have about a 10% lab belt, it makes no sense whatsoever. Because every, just because you have a CERAC, I'm not picking on CERAC, it could be E4D, any of the CAD CAM technologies. If you're la it's just math. At what point does the amount of work that I would do with that unit surpass what I'd be spending on my lab bill? And so I don't buy that at all. 3D, are you placing implants and doing sinus lifts and block grafts at this point? You're right out of school, do you have the skill to do that service? Well, of course not. So then why do you need 3D imaging? And if you need a 3D image of a patient at this point in your career, there's probably a radiology lab or an oral surgeon or somebody who has that technology that you can send your patient to and have that. By the care. way, I, I know what it, that, that was the best yeah. advice on the deal. Um, every periodontist and oral surgeon is dying to go meet a dentist. Exactly. So when you call them and say, can yeah. I send a patient exactly. there for free? They're like, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and, uh -huh. and so do you have to buy that? Of course not. Yeah. Of course not. I mean, you've got to have a budget. And a lot of these people will buy a $300,000 x-ray machine and use it three times a month. <laughs> and then the periodontist is sending you bouquets of cookies and yes. flowers <laughs> and trying to take you out to lunch. He, he would have done all those for he free. He would have done them for free. Yeah. He'd have done yeah. those for so free. So one last thing. I only got you for two minutes. One last thing. So what if, what if this dentist is driving to work right now and he knows there is a practice two miles down the street that is for sale. Is there any numbers or metrics that come to mind of an easy armchair analysis? Yes, the best how thing, many patients, how much the best money? Thing, the, best, the best number he can remember right now is, real, is a real good one. It's 541-389-9088. <laughs> Call me and run those numbers by me and I'll tell him exactly what to look for. And I'll tell him, is this a good thing or not? Okay, and say say that number again then. 541-389-9088. And or, if you're a woman dentist listening to that, please write that on every woman's bathroom wall you ever use the rest of your life for a <laughs> good time. Now, but um but 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 is but is I mean but is, is there any metric of like 
a, a number per charge? I mean, should, the, should there be a dollar value on the charge? Is there, is there any it, low it's hanging? All, it's all different. It's, it, all, it's different. all different. And I don't think the, the rules of thumb, I don't think I can throw out a rule of thumb because you think about the United States where we're talking to most of these dentists. I mean, you think about it, you're a rural practice in Maine or you're an urban practice yeah. here in Phoenix. Yeah. Those numbers don't, uh, don't even match up. So well, I hate Bill, we're out of time, and all I want to say is if you're listening to this on iTunes, you're really cheating yourself because these are the two best-looking bald dentists <laughs> that ever walked the face of the earth. Seriously, dude, um, thank you for being my thank personal you, idol. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so Thank you for much. being my yeah, role model. It. Thank you yeah. for all that you've done yeah. for your patient, your family, and, and for dentistry. Thank um, you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Big force in my life. Thank you. All right, buddy. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs>